you and hello to everybody. It really is a privilege to be here. And I want to talk about our very early development, going right back to pregnancy, childbirth, and the early weeks and months. So often with arts therapy, drama therapy, we leap into the older child, the teenager or the adult. And I got more and more interested in attachment and what goes on at the very, very beginning, particularly since I am convinced that attachment actually starts during pregnancy. A lot is learnt by the unborn child. A lot is learnt before they are actually born. And I'm going to share some pictures with you and discuss them as we go along. And then there'll be time for questions at the end. So let me share my screen. And then I will put some slides up. And please make, just make a note if there's anything that you would like to ask me in the first break or at the end. So we're talking about play and creativity, and I'm particularly looking at anxiety and insomnia, because I think we live in very anxious times. Everybody has the anxiety from COVID and what is happening, as well as alongside huge political changes. There is a lot of unrest, people finding different ways to express that unrest. And it's as if we're living on shifting sands all the time. And of course, it affects children. And for children, they are less able to explain what is worrying them. They have physical symptoms. They have tummy ache or headache. Don't really want to go back to school. And one of the issues that I will expand on a little later is how often we don't bother to explain things to children. We assume they're too young to understand or they're old enough to understand. But how often do we actually sit down and answer questions and explain what's going on or explain why we don't know what's going on? Children are children, they're not little adults. So let's look at how that develops in early childhood. I'm particularly pleased about my research work at the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford, because people that know me well know that Shakespeare comes a lot into my work in terms of how I think, his use of metaphor, his amazing structures of families, Midsummer Night's Dream as a play is one I come back to time and time again. It has answers to it. You can see me in the garden there and just in front are the books for children, for small children, three to five year olds about the stories of moose and mouse. And these stories are very much attachment stories. And it's how two very different animals become friends. You can see about that on my website and you can also see Moose and Mouse on its own YouTube channel. So when I'm anxious, my brain is like a whirlwind. Nothing makes sense. Everything is jumbled up. And the more anxious I feel, the more the world fe feels like a continuous storm. And we don't always say helpful things to children and young people when they're anxious. We say things like, calm down. Well, if a child could calm down, they would. They actually need help to calm down. And the younger the child, the more help they need to calm from an adult. Because when a young child is anxious, they've already released all types of chemicals, in their brain that can only be soothed away and that soothing has to come from another adult. So I think it's important to remember that children need help when they're anxious. And there may be a whole 
list of reasons that a child gets anxious, not just one single reason. And babies can actually be born anxious if there's been a lot of anxiety during the pregnancy. So just some of the reasons that I might be anxious. If I'm in isolation a lot, if I'm left to my own devices and there's no one to share things with or ask things of, that in itself can make me increasingly anxious. Sending children to their bedrooms when we feel they've misbehaved is the, probably the most destructive thing we can do because sending a child into isolation means the release of harmful chemicals and because a child might become compliant it's not actually to say they're okay they're actually dealing internally with anxiety because they're not being allowed to express it it may have been passed on transgenerationally it's well known that anxious parents usually have anxious children. And it was Michael Rutter that did some very interesting research, longitudinal research, that if one parent after a trauma could cope, 80% of children themselves would cope. But if both parents are not coping, then it's unlikely the child will be able to cope. And if children see adults who are anxious, even if adults are trying to hide it, they will pick up. Children are very, very astute at picking up cues in adults. Does a parent have an anxious style of parenting? Are children being worried about all the time, about their performance, about their routines, about their personality, about whether they've achieved certain goals, let alone COVID. There are still many anxious styles of parenting. And of course, early adverse experience. What's been going on in the early life of the child? And has there been trauma that has never been resolved? And therefore, there is anxiety. And of course, there can be a genetic factor in it as well. So if you put all those things together, is it any wonder that there is a lot of anxiety at the moment? And there on the left, you see Moose and Mouse, the two friends, just looking at this child sleeping with a deer, which I think is a very lovely illustration of both nurture and nesting, which is what I want to talk about in relation to anxiety. And that's a, a painting done by a colleague of mine. Just look at the landscape, very calm landscape, and look at these large creatures looking after the child. We hear a lot about nurture, but we don't hear much about nesting. So I will elaborate in a moment. So I'm putting those two words together as a new approach to tackling anxiety and insomnia. And both of these books you can find additional information. The book on the right is about my PhD research in Malaysia, where I took my own children and we lived with the tribe for 18 months, looking at their child rearing and how the children grew up into being non-competitive, very peaceful adults. And neurodramatic play is documented in the book on, on the left of actually, how does it work? So the basic tenets for nurture, being held, being affirmed. So it's not just holding a child, it's actually affirming the child's identity, however small, being able to name them and talk with them, even if 
the baby does not talk back. Cradling and rocking, whether it's in arms or whether it's in a cradle, again, it is soothing, it helps sleep, and it helps calming. Being able to understand information, being able to actually understand what we're being told, which means as adults, we need to be very clear how much does a child understand? Because often a child will say yes or nod, because that's what they think we want them to do, rather than actually understanding what is being said. We need to be able to manage changes, so changes aren't sudden and unexpected, particularly with very young children. Because remember, the time memory is the last of the senses to develop. And if there's a sudden change of house or place or parenting or nursery, children are confused because they don't yet have the brain developed for processing that. And that goes together with understanding transitions that now we're here, but then tomorrow we'll be there. We need to understand a lot more about children's memory and just how much can they hold in their memory. I mean, for the very small child, when mum's gone, she's gone. There's not the idea she'll come back. That's a concept that develops. And the sixth one very much is about feeling safe. If I feel safe, then usually the other things will follow. But not feeling safe means the whole time I'm on edge, I'm anxious, who is going to be there, who will come back? Am I being abandoned? And fear of abandonment, even in a society that's not torn asunder with war, is very prevalent amongst very small children. Moving on from nurture to nesting, the idea of nesting, what does it give us? It gives, again, we have safety. It contains and it gives borders. It gives comfort and reassurance. And it's what I call the holding base for the child. I know when they first came out, baby grows for small babies were very, very popular. Here was an all-in-one garment that was warm enough to sleep in. You didn't have to have a blanket or anything. But the idea of a baby grow has no borders. Babies can kick out and stretch, but there's not, no limit there. And I think that produces a lot of anxiety that there's no holding. The nest is comforting and it's reassuring. And if you've got your plasticine with you, um, if you haven't, don't worry, but if you have got your plasticine with you, as I'm talking, I'm going to ask you to make a nest, very, very simply to make a nest, okay? And this is what I mean about the containment, that there are limits and borders and holding. It's a very reassuring place to be. Of course, the most reassuring will be to actually be held by <clears throat> mum or whoever is the dominant attachment figure. It might be dad, it might be another partner, it might be grandma, who knows, but during the very early life, there needs to be one adult primary attachment figure to whom the baby relates initially before they generalize out into other attachments. So in neurodramatic play, 
one of the basic tenets is that we have circles of attachment. That's where it all starts. And the first circle of attachment is in the womb, where the infant is in warm fluid for nine months. And to remember also that it's in the dark. And there's a huge adjustment coming from nine months in the dark into the light. And newborn babies are very light sensitive. So when they're born in hospital that has a lot of aluminium and chrome and huge spotlights, it's really not very helpful. When they can be born in a birthing pool with muted lighting or even candlelight, either in a mother and baby unit or at home, generally speaking, you will have a calmer baby. If you've also got music that was played during the pregnancy and is played during the birth, again, you have something else that usually will calm the baby if it gets at all distressed. The babies recognize their own music that was played. I'm told that Mark Mozart is the best. I've not, not tried it out myself, but I'm sure you can. The second circle of attachment is in the mother's arms. Mother or carer, again, whoever is the principal attachment figure. If not in her arms, then it might be against her shoulder. And the point about being on the shoulder is that you can also sense the heartbeat. And it's not unusual for babies to change their own heartbeat to the heartbeat of their mothers, which after all, they've been aware of for the nine months before they were born. And you can get synchronized heartbeats after birth. Quite interesting with some dads, if the baby is held here, because Generally speaking, dad's voices tend to be chest voices rather than head voices. You get a greater resonance. And I know quite a lot of dads or uncles, or male friends who are very good at calming small babies because of that resonance that's sensed in the chest when they talk to the baby. The third circle of attachment is in what I say, call mother's awareness. And I'm sure a lot of you will remember waking up in the night five minutes before the baby woke up because you were fine tuned to the baby's experience. So that is the third circle of attachment that develops during that first six months the fine tuning, as we call it, of the third circle. I think that is a, just an amazing attachment picture that this teenager had been grooming this cow for a competition. And he didn't win the competition, but at the end of this day, he was absolutely exhausted. And I love the way the cow is nurturing him. And I think that is a, a lovely example that he's made a nest against the cow and the cow is nurturing him. I don't know how you're getting on with making your nests, but maybe you can think about what you would like to put in your nest. Maybe it would be an animal or a bird, or maybe a baby. It's your choice, but make something or other person or creature to go in your nest, okay? Now, I think this is a very, very interesting picture because um, this was a group of people on a training course with me. And 
one of the things you have to do when you train in neurodramatic play is to make a toy that's at least half as big as yourself. And I found it interesting that this woman constructed in, in such a way that not only could she hug it, but she could actually rest her chin on its head. So everybody in this group had created large monsters to play with. But her monster was also one that she could cuddle, rest her head, and also use it in her practice in therapeutic play. <clears throat> Coming to think about what happened to all your toys? Did you give them up as an adult or a teenager? Are they still in the attic somewhere? Did you give them to your own children? I wonder. Something else about nesting is if we can nest together with a soft toy, that also is a very soothing thing. One young client, she was 14 years old, would come to the playroom and she would get all the soft toys and put them on the couch and then she'd curl up herself and go fast asleep. And there was something about being in the playroom with the soft toys made it a safe place for her to sleep. Now, the picture on the left of the twins is very interesting because this was a first pregnancy and the doctor was concerned that the babies should be born in hospital, not at home. And they were slightly premature, <clears throat> not much. And initially they were put in separate incubators where they fretted. They just would not settle. And in the end, the mother said to the nurse, look, they've been together for nine months. Why can't you put them together now? And it was extraordinary that it was mum that had to think of this. The hospital, it hadn't occurred to the hospital that this could help. So here you see they've been put together in the same incubator. They've turned towards each other and they're holding their wrists together. And they calmed and went fast asleep. The second picture was after a somewhat exhausting delivery. And dad was in there helping as well. And you can see newborn and dad are just exhausted and fast asleep. But again, they're snuggled up together. And that is something we actually need to think through. When I talk to midwives and mothers and babies and antenatal groups and so on, some people are quite horrified at the idea of babies sleeping in parents' beds. And nurses will say things to mothers like, you might smother the baby, um, you might roll onto the baby, etc., cetera, et cetera. Well, providing parents follow sensible guidelines, um, there is no risk to the baby. And where it has been reported, it has usually been if one or both parents have had too much alcohol, for example, and therefore are not vigilant about the child. But to put a newborn baby in a separate bedroom in the dark on her own is not conducive to calm sleeping. It's not a nurturing thing to do. So if you don't have baby in your own bed, to have it in a cradle right next to your bed so you can rock it 
reach out, stroke or soothe or talk or sing. It takes time for a baby to feel okay about being physically separated into a separate room. Something to think about. Why do we so much want to put babies into their own rooms? Again, it's this idea of them becoming little grown-ups too quickly. If we have an opportunity to work with parents, the ideal situation is to go from the crib by the bed, slowly across the other side of the room, but still in the parents' room, and very gradually into their own room, and into their own room where you have a night light and you leave the door open. So there's that sense of connection still continues. When I did my research in, in the rainforest in Malaysia, the whole family slept near each other until children were six, seven, eight years old. And then they had another scheme. Seven, eight year olds used to band up together and go off and sleep in somebody's house where they felt like it. And my youngest was eight and I felt some concern as he went off and slept with a, a group of six or 10 children of a similar age and they would just decide whose house would they sleep in. So the circles of attachment provide the safety, they contain, they hold the borders, they provide familiarity, and that's important, that the familiar experience is very reassuring to the small infant. And of course, they give sensory experience as well, which we all know in child development is very important. So neurodramatic play. Let's understand a little bit more about that now. We're talking six months before birth and six months after birth, which is the main time when neurodramatic play is developing. I've separated messy play from sensory play because I think messy play is very important, but it's also culturally very sensitive. There may be families that don't like the idea of messy play and they spend a lot of time getting children to be clean and tidy, to be toilet trained and not to play with their food. Whereas I think we need to help families understand that messy play is part of child development. The child is born in a mess. When they're first born, they're sticky, slimy, they've been in this water. And these days, nurses and doctors are much more sensitive and put the baby straight onto the mother's chest to, to connect with her heartbeat as well. So the beginning in itself is messy. Gradually, babies are washed and have something clean put on them. Whereas historically, babies would be grabbed by the nurse and washed straight away. Washed and weighed were the two things that used to happen. Now we're more sensitive to the baby mother needs. But messy play is what we need to develop in order to develop our creativity, to develop form and shape. Now, when you started off with your plasticine or your clay, it was very messy. And out of that, you've been creating form. It's the same with the small child, that whether it's finger paint, whether it's shaving foam or other messy play materials, they will be learning how to make things. And they don't need any direction. They don't need grown up interference, although we need to be around for, for health and safety, obviously. 
but messy exploration will lead somewhere. A messy play isn't the only sensory play, but is a very important one. So all other senses are stimulated and developed during this early time. Sound, smell, taste. And obviously touch. As well as sensory and rhythmic play, sorry, messy play, we have rhythmic play, which of course starts with the heartbeat and develops into actual rhythmic playing, which parents can help with, with chanting, different children's rhymes, clapping games, rocking games. And I think one thing to think about is when a child has a meltdown, they are actually out of rhythm. When a child has a meltdown, they are actually out of rhythm. They've lost their internal rhythm, which is why rocking very often helps a meltdown to dissipate. Now, remember, a meltdown is different from a tantrum. When a child has a tantrum, it's for a purpose. There's a goal in a tantrum. In a meltdown is when a child is absolutely overwhelmed. There's too much stimulus in the environment, which is why they so often happen in shopping malls, for example. And being able to take a child away from that environment and soothe is the quickest way back to recovery. Because we need to remember that when children have meltdowns, it's very fearful because they have lost the plot, they've lost control, and they need help to get it back again. It's like the anxious child at night, it's the same principle. Adult support is needed there to regain equilibrium. And of course, dramatic play, it happens during pregnancy. Mothers talk to their unborn children and answer themselves as if they were the child. That's a very earliest example of role reversal you can think about. <clears throat> Once the baby is born, within the first four hours, the baby is trying to imitate the expression on the mother's face. And if mum's not too tired to pick up this cue, mum will imitate back. So imitation is the very beginnings of dramatic play, which is why I suggest that civilization is founded on drama rather than on language. That's something that could be discussed and debated, I'm quite sure. So these four aspects, the sensory, the messy, the rhythmic and the dramatic, or interactive is another phrase for the dramatic play, are uh, what are going on during the pregnancy and during the first six months. <clears throat> and children that haven't had those experiences and are suffering from developmental delay, we need to find ways as therapists, special ed teachers, play workers and so on, to reintroduce those ways of playing in age appropriate ways. So good old mud pies. I mean, just as they're now realizing it's really important for people in the COVID era to go outdoors as much as possible. It's really important to encourage outdoor play for children. And certainly in the UK, when there's been a loss of playgrounds and playing fields and outdoor space, 
we need to rediscover ways of making that happen. Small children need to be outdoors at least four hours a day. And here, this drawing of an actual scene of these children playing together in mud was a delight because again, there was no adult interference. They were playing in their own particular way, scooping it up, molding it, sticking things in it and so on. If we don't live near an open space, if we don't have a garden, we can still go for a walk somewhere to do messy outdoor play. And again, rhythmic play, a way of really encouraging percussion, both individually as well as together in a group like this. Something that I use quite a lot therapeutically is the two-headed bongo drum. Because the two-headed drum, like the one the child has on the left, you can put it between yourself and the child and they can choose which end they want and you can play out nonverbal conversations together. A lot can be expressed through bongo drums. Hmm? Yes, I think that photograph captures very well my idea of the child who is nurtured. I was talking about the, the crib being right next to the bed, the nested child. Now, something that I learned from living with the tribe in Malaysia was how babies are carried most of the time. So the very small ones are carried in a sling in the front and the older toddler is carried in a sling on the back. And it, that may be mum, it may be grandma, maybe dad, it may be auntie. But babies and toddlers are carried most of the time. Once they can walk independently, then that's a whole new phase. Then they are allowed outdoors, on the ground, running around with other children. And often the toddler will become the baby in family role play that the older children are doing outside. But of course, we have to note that the children in the tribe were breastfed till four years old, sometimes five. And if mum had a new baby, it was not unusual to have a, a newborn baby on one breast and the toddler feeding on the other breast. So there was no imposed weaning. The child stopped feeding when they were ready, which meant you did not get sibling rivalry in the same way when older children feel deprived when they see the newborn baby feeding. So co-feeding like co-sleeping, why not? And all of this, the nurture, the nesting, the elements of neurodramatic play are in the context of a mindful environment. And these four things, presence, awareness, kindness, and relaxation, are very important for the calming of children. 
By presence, we mean you're there for the child and how easy it is to get distracted on our iPads and mobile phones. But even to have half an hour where we're not distracted by anything else to actually be truly present for the child. It means we're paying total attention, we're totally focused and we're not distracted by anything else. If we're aware, it means we're open, we're checking, we're noticing, we're very much awake. What's going on around us is clear and it's vivid. The kindness is very important because it's non-judgmental. It's acceptance, it has patience. And together with relaxation, it's not striving. We're not the whole time looking for milestones. Children are allowed to be. And there's something about just letting go of demands. And there can be demands within the family, you know, grandparents saying, well, when you were young, I didn't let you do this and that and the other. And there's something easy about relaxation. And it's surprising when we let go, how much easier child rearing becomes. So it's important to think about a mindful environment and perhaps to think about what in our current environment actually makes it stressful. What can we do to reduce the stress in our own surroundings. We can look at our furnishings. We can look at our lighting. We can look at how we manage time. We can look at how we manage meals. We can look at when is the time when we come together and when is the time to allow everyone to be separate. So there are a lot of things we can look at to actually allow our environment to be more mindful, not only for babies and children, but for ourselves, because we're also stressed right now with COVID. We're more stressed than we ever used to be. What is going to happen to the economy Will we get our jobs back again? If we've lost our jobs, will we find another one? Is it stressful to be working from home? Do we actually have a room we can work in? And what about the older generation? We're not allowed to see them, we're not allowed to visit. People have died without due ceremony. And it's as if there's a second wave of anxiety now, of worry, are the vaccines working? Should I not have a vaccine? It's been over 12 months of continued stress of different sorts. And I think we need to be proactive to try and undo some of those instances, particularly the ones that we have no control over. They're rather like I'm suggesting for children, maybe we need to look for ourselves at being more nurtured and the idea of having a nest in our own environment. If you've actually been able to make your nest with something in it, I'm going to ask you to think of a story to go with your animal or person. And the story can be anything you would like it to be, but it must include an element of nurture at some point. 
Now this is the real life picture that the painting was taken from. And you see this toddler absolutely relaxed and asleep with the reindeer. And the fact that the reindeer is very watchful. And this is a photograph taken in Mongolia and you can see the, the tents there as well. Okay. Now, just a couple of minutes being a bit commercial here, just reminding everybody that this book is now published. The International Handbook of Play, Therapeutic Play and Play Therapy. And to tell you that our new course is starting April to July. So if you're interested in exploring anything I've talked about right now, there actually is a training course. You can look online, make a note of the website. And it's very much an international community. You can see the different countries that people come from. We have bursaries if there are struggles with financing. So do think about applying for one of our courses. You can do a single course there on Eventbrite, or you can apply to do the diploma. And that's what it entails, over 36 hours of live online teaching. I'm just going to leave that picture on the screen for a moment for you to make any notes from it, okay? Okay, I'm going to stop the screen sharing now. So Dr. Sue, while we wait, uh, can you tell us more about the upcoming training and what uh, you'll be going over in that training? Yes, it, uh, it's a six module training that people can gain a diploma in neurodramatic play. And it's over two, two weekends a month for three months. Um, or if people want to spread it out over six months, they can do one weekend a month. And it covers the basic principles of play and attachment and how those develop into small child play, but also interventions for the older child. So, of course, people have not been able to practice because of COVID. Um, so we have an alternative assessment route whereby we create um, a fictional family for them where they can write up how would you practice neurodramatic play with this family if you were with them. So people aren't excluded if they happen not to be uh, to have access to children. People can then do a three module advanced course and they can also do a trainer's course so they can become licensed NDP trainers in their own right if they want to. But there's a lot on the website and there's, uh, uh, there's also an NDP YouTube channel as well as the moose and mouse one. So again, people can see talks on there and find out more about it. Excellent. Thank you so much. We'll make sure to include a link to that in the show notes when we post this. And yeah, everyone watching, definitely check out the trainings. Uh, this is really great stuff. And yeah, Dr. Sue, we were just so blessed and grateful for you uh, joining us today. Really appreciate you sharing your time and your knowledge with us. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, until next time, I'm Dan Pierce, and I will see you later. Thanks so much for joining us.